early on, I learned like certain keys and certain tricks to writing. And, you know, you can even see that in literature, like, uh, um, well, recently I had the, the opportunity to uh, hang out with Arundhati Roy and listen to her talk shit about Salman Rushdie. And <laughs> she was just like, you know, her, her critique is similar to some of my critique of, of a lot of what hip hop is, even like supposedly the real hardcore stuff. It's, it's uh, all the tricks and it's all the, the things that make, that, that, that make it seem like you're clever, right? And with what's considered lyricism, a lot of it is that, like, I'm clever, look at how I use this word and stuff like that. And I, I definitely did that a lot. And, but it gets, it, it's, it starts being very uh, limiting to me. And I'm, you know, it ends up being like having a job. Like, so sometimes I get, get asked to do features on other people's stuff or something like that. And I know what they want. I know what their listeners want. And I can do that. But it's not, it doesn't feel like I'm, it doesn't feel like I'm really commenting on things. It feels like I'm looking for cute ways to say things. So I started, so I started figuring out ways to expand on that and trying to figure out ways to make it feel real and what, what and make it make it feel like I'm commenting on what's really going on in my head and what my emotions are. And that became going away from some of those tools. Of course, you, you know, I don't want to make something abstract, so I'm using some of the tools that people are used to to let them hear what's going on. But so going from that, then I, you know, got more and more into to conceptualizing things and trying to make it bigger and you know last year we did this uh 78 person performance called the Coup shadow box which was like three stages or five stages in one room with several bands cooperating and playing at the same time and a uh, uh there's a lyric on you are not a riot that says you are a sitcom based on a torture chamber so we go from that to a sitcom based on a torture chamber Lie. And then, you know, there's all puppet show, different things like that. And so I'm trying to, and, and so I'm, I'm hoping that keep by keeping myself excited about creating, then, you know, I'm pushing something and uh, getting people excited about life and about engaging in life and about engaging in the world. So that pushes to where, you know, we are with this movie, which is, yeah, yeah, it's music, you know, it's, it started out as me figuring, you know, not being excited about writing another album, so I wrote a movie, and then, and to, to then write music based on, and um, I didn't know if it was going to, I didn't know if it was going to be ever made, or anything like that, because it's pretty, far out there, um, but it got published in McSweeney's as, a, as its own paperback book earlier this year, and then um, Sundance brought me to the labs, and we're going to film it next year, so, yeah, yeah. so it's, it's a surreal dark comedy with magical realism and science fiction inspired by my time as a telemarketer. It's called Sorry to Bother You. <laughs> There's monsters in it and stuff. The uh, lead effects engineer from Beasts of the Southern Wild, he's helping me make the monsters. Um, Guillermo del Toro is consulting on some of the stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go see it. So. Yeah. David Cross and Patton Oswalt are involved with it. Nice. So, um, so, yeah. I, just so that the the thing that keeps that pushes me is necessity to do it you know yeah. <laughs> like it it needs to happen and you know i i i'm i'm saying it as it, it might sound as if 
I'm uh, as if I'm downplaying the need, the artistic need to create. But I think all of that stuff is very much a part of everything. I mean, if I had to work 12 hours a day doing something else, I might not have time, or even I might not even have the 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 will to do it yeah. anymore. So. You know, that, that I'm privileged that I was in a city at a particular time. Well, MC Hammer is why I'm able to do this. Because every because of MC Hammer, and to a lesser extent, Digital Underground, every label had to have a group from, from Oakland. And, you know, and they didn't listen to it. They were just like, you got a group from Oakland? You know? <laughs> You know, and they just, okay, cool. So, we, you know, we were in the right place at the right time, and it gave me a little space to create. Yeah. Um, so let me, just, let me just ask this before we get into some political topics today that I want to know your guys' opinion on. But I also want to know, like, I'm a fan of origin stories, like, like, like the best Wolverine movie is the first one where you find out like how he got his powers, you know what I mean? And um, so with the origin story, like both, where did you get, how, how did the politics come together? And then also like, when did you realize that hip hop could be part of the arsenal of fighting back uh, and resistance? In high school for me, like rapping wasn't something that you, could do to have a career or even make a record. Cause you know, back then, I don't think even people knew, in the eighties, it felt like nobody knew where Oakland was. Anyway, I'd go to visit my family in North Carolina and say Oakland, they'd be like, you mean Oklahoma? So like, we always had this very small town. We, people would lie and say they were from San Francisco or something like that. That would never happen now, but you know, and, um, so we used to rap, beating on tables and stuff, and it was just something for fun. And, you know, I think I had like some Schoolie D raps that I knew nobody else knew was Schoolie D raps, and I would say those. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and um, but later on, you know, then I had a friend that I, uh, I had a friend named Johnny, and I was trying to get him to come to, I was an organizer, and I was trying to get him to come to like, police brutality rallies and things like that. And when I say rallies, in the 80s, police brutality rallies were like eight people, something like that. We'd be like, we had a victory, we gotta sum this up as that, you know, eight people. And, um, but so I'd be like, you come to the, to the rally and you can get on the mic and you can rap, you know? And that was just my way to get, make it be nine people at the rally. <laughs> and, and he'd be like, well, I'm only gonna do it if you're my hype man. And, um, and so that was how I started, you know, rapping at all. Before I became an organizer, I, ha I had always wanted to, like I wanna be on TV. It was part of that same sort of small town. Nobody knows who you are, what are you gonna do with your life? But people on TV are important, right? So you wanna be on, I wanna be on TV, I wanna do, I wanna be Prince, I wanna, you know. Something like that, but I didn't want to practice any instruments or things like that. Uh, and then when I became an organizer, I, I looked down on that earlier feeling as being something that was just individualistic and, uh, you know, a symptom of the society that we're in. To a certain extent, that, that's true, but what I realize now is that it was the same feeling which was you want your life to mean something. When you become an organizer, you realize that your life can mean something. Um, and it's part of the same yearning that people have. You want, you want to engage with the world. And um, so I was doing this with, with Johnny just so he would come to the rallies and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I think he moved away or something. And later on we were doing, uh, I was about 19, and we were doing, uh, I was in this organization that was 
pretty insular called the International Committee Against Racism. It was part of Progressive Labor Party. And um, we would do things like go to neighborhoods and get people to join so they, they can fight racism and whatever that means, you know. Fight, buy the newspaper and fight racism. And so one of the things we would do is go to Double Rock Projects every, uh, we'd, we'd go to Double Rock Projects like every Sunday or Saturday or something like that. And we'd sell the paper, we'd talk to people. Later on, we'd, uh, we'd get together and have a meeting and talk about the individual conversations that we had with each person and how close they are to maybe joining the organization. That's how slow the work was. But anyway, so one of these days we went there and we heard the story of what had happened the day before. And the day before that, this, uh, the, these two twin eight-year-olds uh, were on the corner and cops came out and started frisking them and accusing them of selling dope. And the mother came out to stop this. And it ended up being that the cops uh, beat up the mother and the, the, and the two twin kids. Um, the neighborhood saw this and came running out. Now, a week before this, uh, in a neighboring neighborhood, uh, the cops had beat somebody bloody and rode them around in their police car for hours and let them die. So um, a, a crowd of people came out and were uh, trying to free Rossi and her kids to take Rossi to the hospital themselves. And the police got scared of the crowd, m what might have been like 200 people, and the police started shooting in the air. And if you've ever been around a gun shooting um, and you weren't shooting it yourself, you probably know that the first thing in your mind is to run. And so everybody ran. And at one point, everybody turned back around and ran back and ended up fighting the police, getting Rossi Hawkins and her kids to the hospital. A police, two police cars ended up turned over um, and the police had to run out of there on foot. Um, and this wasn't, none of this got talked about in the news. Um, but so we're hearing this story from a lot of people that day when we go to Double Rock about what happened the day before. And you know, there's a lot of people, so you hear a lot of different things. But what I've said so far is what everybody agreed on that happened. And then there was one other part that everybody agreed on that happened. The time when everyone was running away from the cops, somebody started chanting, and this was the summer of 1989, the number one song on the radio, at least for us, was Public Enemy, Fight the Power. Somebody started chanting, fight the power, fight the power, fight the power. And people talked about it as immediately clicking that they were all there for a reason and that there was something that they needed to do. And they, they, it, it cut through any sort of explanation of a plan or deciding what their different, what their exact political idea about the situation was. It was something that united them. And they turned around and did what they had to do. And uh, it was at that time that, you know, there was something clicked that I said, okay, there's a way to use music to help build a movement. And I'm not good at rapping. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to figure it out. And I did, I, you know, I was, uh, it, it made me like, I knew I wasn't good. And so the, the ideas that I got from being in a revolutionary organization around critique and self-critique um, and around the idea of dialectical materialism. Like, it, it, I knew that 
talent isn't something that, or, or talent is something that everyone is born with. And the fact that it shows up in some and doesn't in others has to do with opportunity and the ability to put um, time into it. So using that idea, I worked on it. And I, you know, methodically got better at it and kept doing it and put myself in situations where I would have to learn. And, uh, but that, that day was the, was the turning point, it's very clear. And I decided to do it. And then, like, I think maybe two years passed and it was about to be New Year's Day on 1991. And I was like, oh, I keep telling everybody I'm gonna make this record. Uh, make this uh, album, and I was working at UPS at the time. Um, another friend of mine that was working there at UPS at the time was this guy who, who ended up going by the name Spice One. Um, and he was always talking about, he's making a record. And so I was like, okay, it's New Year's Eve, it's 10 o'clock, I'm gonna, there was phone books still back then. I'm gonna go through the phone book, and whatever studio, picks up the phone and says they'll open up for me tomorrow morning on New Year's Day. That's where I'm going. And so I spent my money from UPS and this studio opened up and I went, uh, went and um, recorded and, you know, made it happen then. I want to know, as you know, as a teacher, more about perspectives on education. And what I've heard in a lot of your songs is like both a critique of the education system, but also seeing a potential and like supporting teachers fighting back. And that's something that I've dedicated my life to trying to do, and, and would love to hear your your uh, perspectives on on that struggle. Yeah, I've been greatly influenced by my teachers in school. I mean, I have teachers that I would call teachers that weren't in the school that I went to, but uh, I, uh, and, and even more so, uh, the organizations that I've been in, radical organizations, are always teachers, most of them, you know? Um, and, but, so, I have a song called Strange Arithmetic yeah, on, the, on the last, <laughs> album and basically it's just it's it's supposed to it, the idea is to is um in you know honoring the teachers that taught me things that they weren't supposed to in in school and um also realizing just from conversations with friends of mine that are teachers that there are a lot of teachers that are scared to teach their students what they're supposed to be taught. You know, if you teach the, curri the, the curriculum um, that's there, um, you, you have a certain view of history that teaches you not to fight back. Yeah. And, um, that, and, and so the point of the song is that if we're teaching kids, if we're not teaching kids, how to fight back against the system. We're not even teaching them how to survive. We're not teaching them the real way the world works. Um, and so we're doing them a disservice. And so that's what the, you know, um, the last line of the song says, you know, uh, if your school won't teach you how to fight for what's needed, they're teaching you to go through life and get cheated. Um, so it is as important as teaching, it's as important as teaching arithmetic or teaching reading to teach people an analysis of the system that shows them where their power actually lies and how they can organize with other people to change it. Otherwise, there's no way to apply all the other things that they're taught. So, um, and I think um, because of the, I, th I think that, that because of the uh, need that many teachers have 
to help students out, it ends up being that many teachers, or at least that I've run into, and maybe it's just, but uh, are at the very least to the left of center, you know. Uh, and I'm sure there's areas where that's not the case. Definitely, I had teachers that were pretty right wing, um, but a lot of, and and you know, I, it, it, I. I went to school in Oakland, California, only when I was in high school, I, I, I didn't think about it as a short time, but only 10 years, less than 10 years maybe, after the Pan Black Panther Party had dissolved. None of us in our high school knew who the Black Panther Party was. This is a, mainly, it was, it was like 60% black, uh, you know, 30% Asian, 10% uh, Chicano and, you know, less than 1% white. And uh, we didn't know to the point where um, I at one point got a, a, attacked by the principal over the loudspeakers saying, nobody listened to Raymond Riley, he's a communist, <laughs> and he wants to bring us back to the days of the Black Panther Party. So... <laughs> I, so everybody in the classes were like, "Raise what's who's what's the Black Panther Party?" Right? And and because um, this is, I mean, later on we found out most people in Oakland found out who the Black Panther Party was from Public Enemy, but um, I mean, I'm talking about my age range, um, but the teachers. Many of them answered that the Black Panther Party was a black version of the Ku Klux Klan. And so that was the rumor around the school. And this is, this is even with, there was a girl in my class um, named Erica, and she was like, oh yeah, I, I know I was named after one of the Black Panthers. But the thing is, is that, you know, it, uh, there's, there's, there's a few things to notice in that story, and one of them is where, you know, all those Panthers, all those Panthers still lived in Oakland. And um, it's, it's, it, it, it's telling about the makeup of the party that they had that even if that group didn't exist anymore, that those politics weren't being put out at the time in the same way. So, you know, um, but the, the, the point is, is that, so even in Oakland, the, the, uh, and, and then I, it comes to find, later on I found out that one of my teachers was, uh, you know, considered this, or two of them considered themselves socialists, like later on I found that I'm like, wow, I had no idea from being in your classroom that those were your politics. And in, I don't know if it's the same up here, but in California, there's the law that you cannot uh, say anything neutral about communism. You cannot put out a, an analysis that leads people to think that we shouldn't have capitalism. I'd be in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I know there are people that Definitely there are people now in California that don't adhere to that law, but it is there still. And people were following it even, even more. Um, and um, they often would, in the 80s, be, there would be one teacher in, in trouble for advocating revolution in their class. And of course, because they were advocating revolution, the students came around them and you know um, rallied around them. So I thought that that was, um, really interesting. Um, I think that uh, I, the other ways that I deal with education in, in my, you know, I, I, while I was in high school, I know that we would always be told this phrase, education is the key. And what they meant by education was a degree, right? right? And they meant, and what they meant by the key was that you'd have a job if you graduate. That's what they mean, that's what they're saying. Like, you wanna survive, get a, get a degree. 
Um, and obviously that's not really the full analysis of how it all works, right? And, uh, but so in, in doing that, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, educators, especially, uh, you know, folks that are in administration would put out this idea that there's all this trouble going on in communities of color. You know, people are selling dope, people are killing each other, um, people are going to prison, and that the answer to it all is folks going to college. Which, what that actually implies is that um, unemployment comes from people's bad choices. It implies that poverty comes from people's bad choices. But um, most, uh, most uh, economists, whether they're on the right or the left, understand that capitalism needs a certain amount of unemployed people to operate. It cannot exist on full employment. If there's full employment, then you can't threaten to fire people, right? Wages go up. You know, in, in things like the Wall Street Journal, they, they openly worry about the unemployment rate going down, right? And so we know that if there is, if, if there has to be a certain amount of unemployed people, that also those certain amount of unemployed people have to eat. And if they have to eat, that means they're gonna have to get involved in some other business that doesn't have to do with, with a nine to five job necessarily. And that's the illegal economy. And the illegal economy, just illegal business, just like legal business, must have violence. Legal business has to have violence. Like somebody can't come into this store with a shopping cart and just take a whole bunch of books and walk out because either the security here is gonna stop them or the police are gonna stop them. There's a violent force, there's a physical force that stops them. And physical force is what regulates legal business. You have the police to regulate legal business. Illegal business doesn't have the police to regulate for them. They do it themselves. Right. They have to do it themselves. You have to regulate. Otherwise, you can't exist as a business. You can't go to court and say, Your Honor, I was supposed to get a whole key of cocaine. This is clearly 80% baking soda. I demand reparations or restitution. You can't, you, you know, you, there's, there's zoning commissions. Like if, if some other business builds into this wall, you know, they get served with a lawsuit saying don't do that, and the only person to enforce it is the police. There's a physical, even if it doesn't come to that, there's a physical force behind laws and regulations that exist. Illegal business doesn't have that. They can't go to the zoning commission and say there should only be two dope dealers on this block and not three. So that is where the, the violence comes in, right? That's where it, that's, that's part of business, right? And they have to do it themselves. And the, the, um, it, there's a, has to, ends up being a culture around that violence. Anytime you have a certain kind of business or a way of doing business, a culture has to grow around that in order for it to work, right? Fishing villages create fishing songs. Right. You, you, you try to teach a fishing village agricultural songs, they might find it catchy. But it's not going to change whether they're fishing or not. And it's also going to not be as popular as the fishing songs. <laughs> and, and so, this comes from class analysis. This is like something simple that folks that understand that there's a class analysis understands. But a lot of us with those analyses get jobs at nonprofit organizations, 
who have a different mission statement. And their mission statement is not to put out a line that says this whole system has to change. Their mission statement is to put out a line that says the system works, people just haven't figured out how to live inside it. So we end up having a lot of radicals or would-be radicals that work for nonprofit organizations saying, we're going to stop the violence and stop the poverty in this community by having classes on how to talk to each other nicer. We're going we're gonna to have a seminar on the right tie to wear to a job interview. We're going to, you know, uh, we're going to teach people um, this skill, right? They, they, the problem is this community doesn't have the skills, right? And the truth is, yeah, you can shift stuff around. You know, you, you know there's, you're unemployed and you have a job. And then instead, I could teach you a better skill than this guy, but then he's out of a job. So it doesn't really solve anything. But you're saying to a group of people, OK, um, this is crabs in a barrel. Let me teach you how to be a stronger crab. And it's not talking about solving the problem. So part of that whole idea, though, is you, know, you have educators that are sitting in communities of color with this idea that the system works and the problem are the students and we could teach them a way to survive in this system that doesn't have to do with changing the system, right? And so part of that line is get your degree, right? Not telling them that, you know, I went to San Francisco State, I didn't graduate, but the people I did graduate with they don't have jobs that they need a degree for, if they have a job, right? Um, and that's the real truth about it. And then some people would think, say, well, if you teach them that, then you're not giving them any hope. But there is hope in getting rid of this system, right? And, you know, so one, one line about that, that I say uh, is, uh, if everybody in the hood had a PhD, you'd say that doctor flipped that burger hella good for me. <laughs> and, you know, here's the thing that we should be teaching people about education. Is that we need education because it's a right to know shit. <laughs> right? It's a pleasure to be able to know what the world is about. It's, it's, it helps you understand the world. And not like, the, you know, education improves your status in the world. Uh, and, you know, and it, it ends up serving, you know, that whole line ends up serving an opposite purpose. Because I know for me and my friends, um, you know, they'd be like, you know, you guys are behind. You know, the students in Japan, they go to school on Saturday and half a Sunday. And, you know, and if you, uh, it, and, and look at UC Berkeley, you know, they're, they're not letting people in that have A minus uh, uh, grade point averages. So if you don't, you don't even have a B grade point average, you're not going to college. So it'd be like, okay, guess we're not going to college. You know, like this is, it, 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 it doesn't work. But so some of what ends up being pushed around education is not education to make yourself a better person in the sense of what you know about the world or to learn about things you want to learn about or to have a more fulfilling life, to have conversations about things you normally wouldn't know about. Um, it's... You could get a job in a better office if you go get this kind of education. And then that's not even necessarily true for everybody. Obviously, some people have jobs, so th that exists. But it's, th it's put out there as the answer to what's going on. And um, so 
a lot of time I, I talk about that. Um, and um, I think that that teachers, especially nowadays, um, are doing an excellent job at putting forward um, radical viewpoints um, in, in certain situations like the Chicago teacher strike. Um, you know, what you guys are involved with. And, and, and teachers have sh helped shape my life in many ways, and they, it hasn't necessarily been through the textbook lessons that they were supposed to give me. And so um, that's kind of like what that song is about, is like, how do you touch the students even more? Yeah, but it's, uh, just, just to tell us more about what this movement needs to do to develop and, and challenge, what are some of the obstacles, too, that this Black Lives Matter movement faces? So I think that um, one of the things that happens with many movements and many campaigns, and the reason they die out, one of the reasons is, has to do with burnout, right? And what does that mean, though, burnout? Like, people get tired of it. They don't just, I mean, they're not going and taking a nap. They're, what does it mean? They, people come to a point where they don't think that the movement can do anything, right? And they're like, Am I, I'm spending all my time with this thing, but does it have any power to actually change things? And that's the, the big question. That's the thing that makes people drop out of organizations and parties and things like that. And um, I think, so I have this thing that I, uh, that I always go on, and kind of the condensed version is in the 20s and 30s in the US, there was a mass, there was a mass militant labor movement in the U.S. And um, you had, you had sit-in strikes in the Midwest. You had places like Utah, Montana, uh, Alabama, Colorado with militant fights, militant strikes. And by militant, I mean in Alabama, the, the, the miners were shooting it out with, with corporate uh, thugs. Uh, you had stuff going on in, in Colorado. You had, uh, at, during the 20s and 30s, it was estimated that there was a million card-carrying members of the Communist Party, right? At the same time, there's revolutions going on all over the world. Um, you had a similar unrelated, an un, somewhat unrelated thing called the Bonus March, where all these veterans marched to the White House, some of them carrying guns. It ended up having to be met with, with with tanks. Um, at that time, a lot of the and a lot of the population was radicalized, right? And supporting this. Why? Because they saw the leverage that could be had if you shut down an industry. Right? Because we all know, even if we're not even if people aren't radicalized, they know how the system works, at least to the extent that money runs the show, right? So when, when a way of working that said, okay, to get what we want, we're gonna stop profit. People rallied around that. And not because of some theoretical, I mean, obviously there's a lot of theory around it and people want to feel empowered, but it wasn't only because of that. It was because it seemed viable seemed like something that could work. Um, shortly, I, you know, from that ended up coming the New Deal and things like that. So even the, the thing that, uh, that, the, that the center left puts as the big success of electoral movements really came because the ruling class was scared of revolution that was seen viable and, and possible to grow a lot more. Obviously, right then wasn't going to be a revolution, but it was growing. Another, just on a side note, answer to that was the Rockefeller saying we better start foundations that limit what, what this politic is going to be. Um, but uh, after that period, 
the Communist Party decided to go underground and say, look, there's a fight against fascism. We're going we're gonna to not get in the U.S.'s way of getting rid of Hitler. And that kind of came down from the, the common turn because the Soviets were fighting uh, the Nazis. And there was a united front against fascism. So all of a sudden, all these radicals who, when they were organizing all these other strikes and being part of it, people were saying, this isn't just a strike for wages. This is a strike for wages. We're going to fight militantly, but this is part of a revolutionary movement. And people were around them. People went, uh, the, the radicals and revolutionaries went underground. Um, in preparation for and during World War II, in preparation for the U.S., with the idea that they weren't going to challenge the U.S. while they were fighting Hitler so that Hitler could be smashed. This led, led the way for when, when the McCarthy era came around and they were able to, to say, look, your friend at work that you've known for 15 years and hasn't been telling you is a revolutionary is right there. He's been lying to you. And so that made the, 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 those witch hunt trials a lot easier because that stance had already been taken. I'm very much oversimplifying things, but this is there's a through line with this. And... Um, during that same time, there was uh, the, the revelations about Stalin, and all of those things made the biggest revolutionary organization that the U.S. had ever seen uh, break up into a lot of small groups. Those small groups became the beginning of the new left in the United States. The new left in the United States ended up uh, taking a different route. The one, one of the good things that it did was, you know, it, in the 60s, they were saying that we are revolutionaries. We're open and out with what we're doing. Um, the other thing it did was it moved away from the labor organizing. It moved away from places like Montana and Utah, moved to cities, and moved to organize students. And they, they started putting out the line that the students are the revolution. And it re really wasn't a historical precedent, precedence to that. There was a, a contemporary thing going on with the, with, the, uh, with the cultural revolution in China that may have influenced that as well, but uh, where that, that was led by students. Um, but this was something new. And it meant that the left was leaving behind certain kinds of struggles that people were dealing with anyway, which is how am I going to put food on the table? And when I say the left, obviously there were still people doing that, and that was the unions, which were now pretty liberal and had kicked out all the radicals. And the radicals had left it alone as well. Like, no, they weren't for the most part, fighting to be part of that. But focusing on students um, and other, it gave, made spectacle a lot more important. See, we call these things demonstrations, right? Why are they demonstrations? Well, they used to demonstrate the power that we had to shut down industry. It used to be like, here, we're, this is a demonstration. It's a bunch of people on the street. It's only a demonstration. It's not the actual thing that we're going to do. It's just the threat. <laughs> but now, but then with spectacle becoming center stage, it was the thing. That was it. Get people into the streets. And, and, it, and it made... It made it seem like what you have to do is let your voice be heard. I've heard that a lot. Let your voice be heard. That's an important part of it. But what we put forward when we say that is that all you have to do is get in the street and then we'll shame power into doing stuff for us, right? They see a bunch of people in the street. They feel bad about what they're doing. They don't want to be embarrassed with their friends that, you know, there's 100,000 people in the street. And, you know, so now we're going to do something. The other thing it does is imply that 
it, it centers it all around electoral politics in the sense that, okay, hopefully what this means is that the people, the elected officials feel like we got a lot of people out here. I might not get voted back in if I don't do what they say. So far that hasn't worked, <laughs> right? But, I mean, you, you think about it like this, like we put a lot on spectacle and part of that is because of a, a, an incorrect telling of history, right? Spectacle is important, but you have to have a way to shut down industry and stop profit from being made in order to get even affect small changes. Um, a lot of what a lot of what we look at is the civil rights movement. But think about it like this: biggest action of the civil rights movement, March on Washington. So on TV, like so, TV meant a lot more then. There was no internet, not, not even any cable stations. A lot of places only had one or two channels at that time. It was on TV all the time. This, the fact that there was going to be a march on Washington. There's a civil rights movement. It's all over the place. Only game in town for some people. 200,000 people. Only 200,000 people at that time. That demonstration didn't make what happened happen. You know, in my mind, it was kind of like professional wrestling, right? There's a change that needs to happen so that this movement doesn't get more radical. And let's say that it was this. It was, you know, definitely it was a, um, and, and, and then we see when King got more radical and said, okay, we need to start having general strikes. That's when he got killed, right? Um, so the, 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 the focus on spectacle, not only, is it not that it just doesn't work, but people don't join it because a lot of the time, you know, if you're an organizer, you've run into this, like all those marches, what is it gonna do? And we don't really have an answer for that. We really don't, like what is it gonna do? And I've been, I've been involved in a lot of police brutality campaigns through the years and, you know, kind of figured out certain answers to that. But the truth is, we don't know. And the reason that we don't know is because we are not showing people where the crux of their power is. And the crux of their power is that this is a system that relies on exploitation. The folks that are m making the wealth are the ones who control the legislators. They're the one, it's not the voters that control the legislators. It doesn't matter what the, the folks say in their campaign that they're gonna do. They're not gonna do it if the ruling class doesn't want them to do it. There might be a little bit of leeway inching this way or that way, but you know, when we talk about the great gains that have been made, none of them have been made by electing the right person into office. Right? The New Deal didn't come because people were like, oh, we got to get Delano Roosevelt in there. It came because, like I said, there were massive strikes and stuff going on all over the place. Affirmative action came in under Nixon. Not because he just had one part of him that was progressive and the rest of him was fascist. It came because he had to, because there was a growing movement happening and they didn't want to see it get more radical. You can make any politician do whatever you want them to do if you can affect the profits of the ruling class. Um, there's a great documentary on YouTube called Breaking the Foundations. And it's about a, uh, the Building Labor Federation in uh, Sydney, Australia. And it's kind of a history of them from the 40s to the 80s. And uh, basically, in the 60s, they were a militant union. Not necessarily radical, had radicals in it, but they were militant. They would have these strikes, they were all big dudes, they would keep the scabs out, and what's more, they'd go to the scabs' houses and beat them up. So that there was no way for them to have replacement workers. The boss had to deal with them, the thing was shut down, it's not gonna happen. Um, then they were like, how do we make this more radical? 
And then there were, were, would be there were community groups that said, look, there's gentrification going on over here. People are getting kicked out because they're building these high rises. So they said, OK, in this area and that area, uh, nobody's building there. Right. So they got tremendous support from the community. Then other things would happen in other cities. Somebody would have a labor struggle or something going on with this particular company. And if that particular company was building in Sydney, they'd shut the building down. They, that building is not getting made until you deal with that thing in that other city. Um, that's a different idea. That's not just a trade union movement. It's a radical, militant labor movement. Um, and um, they had, there are other problems. They got to a certain point, and developers started disappearing people. But and that didn't stop them. They kept doing other stuff. But the, the, the thing is this. Whatever movement we have, whatever demand we have, we have to look at where our actual power is to affect the change around that. Right. And, if, and, and if the Black Lives Matter movement is going to grow, it's going to be because people see it as, viab as, as having a viable way of changing the situation. Right? Some of us, you know, artists, we feel like saying what we're saying, you know, yelling at the stars is enough. But the average everyday person doesn't feel that way, right? They want, the, if I'm going to spend my time, it better, I, I want to know if it can work, right? It's not that people are, it's not that the average everyday person, uh, even people of color, nobody's sitting around being like, oh, I kind of like uh, police brutality. <laughs> That's not why they're not showing up. They're not showing up if they don't think it could work. Occupy Oakland, we, got, we had 50,000 people show up for this general strike that we called with only one week out. And I, be, I really think that it's because people saw that just that idea was something viable of, of shutting down profit. And, and, and there was a lot of critique going back and forth about that it wasn't a black movement, it wasn't a movement for people of color, but again, I had been involved in organizing in the Bay Area for 20 years before that. And it was the most black folks um, I had seen at even when organizations were all black, right? Because people were, you know, one reason that people don't get involved in stuff is they're like, I got to pay my bills. And we're not tying these things. That's the main thing people are worried about in white communities, black communities, whatever. They're worried about paying their bills. And this other stuff is a problem that happens while people are trying to survive. Right. So the key to getting people involved is making them feel like there's a place of power, a point. What's the leverage point? And the reason that we haven't been doing that is because the left has been running away from the class struggle for the last 40 years. So we want to make these movements bigger, make them have the ability to win. And to make them have the ability to win, we got to tie them with, with wage struggles. Yeah. So one thing that could immediately be done is the Black Lives Matter movement could tie in with the fight for 15. There you go. Right? That's just one idea, whatever. But, um, you know, um, there could be other things going on. But, and, and, and I don't mean the legislative fight for 15. I, I think that... that uh, you know, electoral struggles in when people go to the ballot box, right? There's, they're not, there's no more movement go in, in there. You know, you saw the first anti-war movement get torn down by the Kerry movement, right. right? Then there was another anti-war movement that built up, got torn down again by the Obama election. And, you know, I... People in my family were in really like hyped and part of the grassroots organizing of the Obama campaign. And they were like, we're building this network. And, and really, there was a network, right? But the whole point is you're selling people. It takes a lot of energy to get somebody elected. And you're selling people you, in order to do that.
you're selling people that this is a game changer, right? So you told people that this is a game changer. We get this person in the office. That's why you got to do all this work. That's why it's important for you to come out. And we're not really telling them the truth. We're not really telling them the truth, even if you think that's part of the plan. If you tell them that this is only part of the plan, it's really a lot harder to get them to the, to the ballot box. This is just one of, of a six parts of the plan. <laughs> that doesn't get people to the ballot box. So people, good people, distort the truth and say, we have to do this. This is the thing that's going to change it all. So that means as soon as they go to the ballot box, they're not in that movement anymore. And there's no movement left. And we, we you know, we, and, and again, this is a development that's only happened since the 60s, which is a long time ago, but it wasn't like that beforehand. The idea of radicals having to, to be involved in electoral movements in order to make change is, is something new, and it's a result of everything being based on spectacle. You know, obviously not everything. And, and, and what I said, like I said, it's a general idea of what's happened. There's, there was a Detroit Revolutionary Union movement. There were a lot of examples that were not, that, that don't fit into, but, but they, were, they were not the main wave of what people were doing. And, and so, you know, that, that's basically what we gotta do is be involved in class struggle even around issues of racism because otherwise, after Mike Brown, if St. Louis had shut down, if there was no industry happening, there wouldn't even have waited for a grand jury, yeah. right? He would have been under the jail already. Whatever needs to be done to get the profits moving again. Not that it's that easy, obviously. And, and what that means is that's some place that the left is not at right now. That means that we have to work around these other issues and build it to that point. And, and also while we're building other things that aren't there. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we, we really gotta wind down. <laughs>